just knew that we loved playing music and we knew what we wanted. You know, it wasn't like we didn't want to do it because we was going to be a star or we was going to make a bunch of money. We loved it. That's who we were. Welcome to the Jesus Calling Podcast. This week's guests talk about deep losses they've experienced in their lives and how God gave them the courage to keep going, even when their hearts were breaking. Award-winning country music artist, Eddie Montgomery, and Jesus Calling reader, Casey Clausing. Eddie Montgomery is one half of the wildly popular country music duo, Montgomery Gentry, until an unexpected accident claimed the life of his friend and bandmate, Troy Gentry, in 2017. Eddie looks back to when he and his brother first met Troy, their rise to success as friends who love to play music together, and the fateful day of Troy's helicopter accident. Me and my brother had a band, and uh, actually my, my brother John Boyer, John Michaels, everybody knows him, uh, met him first, and then there was a guy that was uh, that was needing a band at a club. And first he was wanting a uh, happy hour. So my brother and T-Roy was going down there doing happy hour, and I was hanging out, and I'd get up and sing some too. And then we put a, put the band together and uh, went into the club and started playing playing the club, and uh, and it worked real good, man. I mean, uh, the club it was always packed. Uh, I remember, uh, I mean, six nights a week, man, we'd have it crowd at the door trying to get in. I mean, we loved it. I mean, we did. We eat it, breathe it, and slip it. Hey man, lightning struck, you know, and uh, it's so funny because Atlantic Records, I heard John, a uh, John boy, and uh, we were playing the dungeon in and called the Congress. And then Sony, uh, I went on the road with my brother, I was playing drums and I quit playing drums because I didn't want to get known as uh, John Michael Montgomery's brother, the drummer, because I knew what kind of music I wanted to do. And we'd always do a lot of charity work back at home, you know, growing up. And that comes from Troy's dad, Lloyd, and my mom and dad. You know, back home, if there was any flooding or tornadoes, you know, my dad or we'd be there and, you know, bring the neighbors together, man, you know, and this is what we'd do. So anytime that me and T, something would happen, and they call one of us, they'd call the other one. And so we just kept playing, and finally we figured out, it's like, well, they want both of us. They don't want one of us. And me and T never thought nothing about it. You know, that's, that's why I think it's so funny because me and T put this duo together. Nashville did not. And I think that's why it's different, you know, and why it always was different. Because, you know, we uh, got each other in and out of trouble. And we had each other's back. We knew who we were, and this is what we was going to sing, and this is what we was going to sing about. I reckon we loved it so much and wanted it, but it was our life. You know, it wasn't like... We didn't want to do it because we was going to be a star or we was going to make a bunch of money. We loved it. That's who we were. You know, and I think it's a different breed in some of them, you know. It's not, you know, because I've heard new artists going like, man, I want to be a big star. And I said, no, we love the music. And we love the people and we love interacting with the people. After making music successfully for 33 years, racking up awards and the adoration of millions of fans, Eddie and Troy were out doing what they loved, being on tour. And as part of that tour, Troy was offered a side trip to see a collection of vehicles from a famous TV movie franchise he admired. Several minutes into the trip, the helicopter carrying Troy crashed near Medford, New Jersey, killing both Troy and the pilot. Eddie tells us about that day and the impact the loss of his friend has had on him since. He's a big Batman freak. And the guy had the original Batmobile and the original Batmobile motorcycle there. So when they told us about it, it was me and him and Eddie Kay, our, our keyboard player, band, was the band leader at the time. And he come up and he's like, hey, this guy's giving a helicopter ride. Y'all want to give him? And uh, I was like, sure. And I was like, All right. I said, T, I said, I'm going to jump in the shower real quick. And uh, he said, well, I'm going to go on down there. And uh, I got out of the shower and I was coming down. They were getting strapped in the helicopter and the guy was firing it up and getting ready to take off. So, um, you know, it's not a day that don't go by. I don't think about him. Miss that big smile of his, man, that big wooden spoon. You know, and he was stirring the pot, boys, and doing something, pulling the practical jokes. After about 33 years of looking till you left, man, it's uh, it's it's different. And so I had to sit back and take a little break, and uh, you know, I didn't know what to do. And so I talked to Angie about it, and talked to the band about it, talked to management about it, and 
And, uh, you know, it's like, and all our friends out there, man, were writing all the cards. And by the way, I want to thank them for all the cards and letters and everything they sent in. It was totally awesome. And uh, they was like, man, we want you back on the road. So I figured I'll, I'll let them make up the decision, man, whether they, they want it out here or not. As always, me and him, you know, it goes back to me and him putting it together and being friends and brothers before we were a duo. You know, because we did, we did have each other's backs, you know, and getting each other in and out of trouble. And so, you know, we were, we were brothers, man. And I, you know, that was it. There's not a day, you know, we go back before we go on stage, man. We get together and thank the man upstairs, man, that, uh, you know, he's let us live this long and let us do what we do and all the stuff that he's given us. And uh, I reckon it goes back to that saying, if it don't kill you, uh, it, you know, it'll help you. It can eat you up. I mean, it really can. And it can take you in some dark places and, you know, and uh, that's, that's, that's that strength that I uh, think that you better, better believe in a man upstairs. I don't know how you explain to anybody the loss of a, a child or loss of your brother or best friend, man. It, uh, you just don't, you know, uh, I think it, uh, uh, if he was to pull my heart out, it'd be, it'd be scarred up pretty bad. That's how, that's how you get through it, and you remember all the smiles, you remember all the good times. As we close our time with Eddie, he reflects on the memory of his friend with a passage from Jesus Calling dated August 14th that talks about how God's presence shines through us in this life and on into eternity. I am yours for all eternity. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the one who is and was and is to come. The world you inhabit is a place of constant changes. More than your mind can absorb without going into shock. Even the body you inhabit is changing relentlessly. In spite of modern science attempts to prolong youth and life indefinitely, I, however, am the same yesterday and today and forever. Because I never change. Your relationship with me provides a rock solid foundation for your life. I will never leave your side when you move from this life to the next. My presence beside you will shine brighter with each step. You have nothing to fear because I am with you for all time and throughout eternity. To learn more about the music of Montgomery Gentry, please visit montgomerygentry.com. Stay tuned to Casey Clousing's story after a brief message about a limited time sale on the hardcover edition of Jesus Always, available at lifeway.com. Embrace joy in His presence with the Jesus Always devotional, now on sale in hardcover at lifeway.com. Now's the perfect time to stock up on encouraging gifts for friends and family, since you can get three copies of the Jesus Always Hardcover Edition for only $15, six copies for $30, or nine copies for $45. This sale ends on June 21st, 2020, so hurry now to LifeWay.com, type Jesus Always in the search bar, and order your three, six, or nine copies of Jesus Always Hardcover Edition today. Purchases must be made in multiples of three to receive the sale price. Casey Clousing always dreamed that one day she would build a family of her own. After suffering through years of infertility, Casey and her husband found themselves blessed with two daughters and thrilled to be expecting another child. But a 20-week sonogram revealed a heartbreaking tragedy that sent the Clousing family reeling and clutching more tightly to faith than they ever had before. My name is Casey Clousing. I'm a mother of four. I grew up in Fairfax, South Dakota. It's really, really tiny town. And I know some people say that they're from a small town. I am from a small town. It has 100 people in it. I grew up on a farm right on the edge of town. And then after I got married, my husband and I jumped around a little bit. And then we settled in his hometown in Sioux Center, Iowa. When we first got married, we knew that we wanted to have a little time just to be married. But we always knew, you know, there was never a doubt with either of us that We both wanted kids. He said when we first got married that he wanted six kids. And I was like, oh, no, no, (laughs) let's let's take a step back here. So now he laughs about it because 
after we've had kids, he's like, what was I thinking? And then, uh, unfortunately, when we decided it was time to start our family, we ran into some fertility issues. And that is so hard on a marriage. And I feel like nowadays I know more people who struggle to start a family than I do that are like, oh, it happened so fast. And so we went through that for a while, too. I remember we had bought a house where we were living in, and the room that would be the nursery, you know, whenever this happened, was right across from our bedroom. And I would go in there into this empty room, and I would just sit and cry and be like, God, why is this not happening for us? And why are we going through this? And just please, please, you know, let this happen if it be your will. And so that was, that was a hard start. But then once it finally did happen, it was so sweet and so wonderful. And we were just so thankful that it had finally happened and that we were able to start our family and that God had given us that, that gift because, yeah, being a parent is just incredible. Our oldest daughter is eight and our second daughter is six. So they're just about 22 months apart and they are awesome. We were good with the two girls, especially with all of the the fertility stuff we'd gone through. We were just happy to have the girls and have them be with us and healthy. And um, we were good. It was toward the beginning of 2015 when I found out we were pregnant with our third. And of course, we were thrilled. And so at our 20-week ultrasound, the first thing we saw was that it was a boy. And so the rest of that ultrasound was just kind of a blur because we were just in shock and we were, we just kept looking at it. Like, can you believe it's a boy? And nothing, nothing seemed to be all that different than the 20 week ultrasounds of the other ones. You know, the ultrasound tech was looking at stuff and checking this and measuring that. And we were just like, how's everything look? And looking back, you know, she never said, anything really she she would make very general comments but everything looked normal there wasn't anything you know like he had 10 fingers he had 10 toes we saw the heartbeat we saw eyes we you know like we saw everything that should have been there so we had no inclination that it wasn't just a perfect little boy we got done with the ultrasound and we went over to meet with the doctor and She came in, and I know the doctor very well. And the first thing I said was, did you hear? It's a boy. And she looked at me, and she said, I did. And it was was in a very, like, monotone response. And I was like, oh, okay. And she sat down, and she turned to us. And the first thing she said was, it's days like this that I hate my job. And I said, "Is, is, is he not okay? And her voice broke up a little bit and she said, he's not. A few problems that, a few big problems that in her words made him not compatible for life outside the womb, which I thought was a very uh, nice way to say that your baby will die. In a, in a second, our life went from, oh my goodness, things are fine, we're having a boy, we're so excited, to, to, to just nothing, to, to complete sorrow and grief. So for the next while, I was a pregnant woman with a baby who wasn't going to live. And I, I didn't know, I didn't know how to feel. You know, he, he was alive and he was kicking, but every time I would feel him kick, then I would think, oh, don't, don't get too excited. You know, don't, don't get your hopes up. So it was like grieving him bef- before he had died. You know, I was grieving what could be and what we wanted it to be, but also trying to keep myself in check. Like, listen, this, this isn't going to be how you want it to be. This isn't going to end the way it ended with the girls. I remember when, before we had gone to the 20-week appointment, 
I had bought a pinata and it was a question mark and it was pink and blue. And so we were going to go to the store and get the candy that was the color of whatever the gender was. And they were so excited about that pinata, you know, they were four and two. So that was a really big thing for them. So I remember the day we came back from the appointment and they said, can we do the pinata? And I was like, we can't. I said, it's a, it's a boy. You're going to have a brother, but we're not going to get to bring him home. We're not. And they were, they were little, they were so confused. And so I didn't want to overwhelm them. I kind of wanted to just break the ice and then let them, I I figured I would, I would just take it as it came, you know, rather than throwing all this terrible news at them and breaking their hearts, just kind of letting them know that we weren't doing the pinata, but you know, we would talk to them. We would answer any questions that they had and just kind of left it at that. And thankfully they were young enough that they, that they didn't really get it, but they still had questions often. Where will he go? Well, he's going to go right to heaven. Well, why? Well, because that's, that's how God made him. Some, some babies get to come to earth and some of them get to go right to heaven. So we tried to, we tried to make that be his, and it is like, he's luckier than all of us. He got to go right up there. He didn't have to deal with the sadness of the world. So we tried to make sure we told them how, how wonderful that was going to be and how lucky he was that the first person he was going to see was Jesus. We just took each question as it came and just made sure that they knew how, even though, even though God had made him this way, it wasn't, it wasn't a bad thing, you know, like he would be in heaven and he would be perfect. And we, you know, we would get to see him again. And even to this day, they talk about him. I mean, he is a hundred percent part of the, part of our family. I mean, um, he is, you know, when someone comes up to me and asks me how many kids I have, they're the first one to say, no, nah, mom, we have this many, which, you know, then you're like, oh, okay, you know, you have to go through that whole, but they, I love that they remember him and and still, you know, honor him by bringing him up and talking about him. And, you know, when they draw a picture of our family, it's us and them and then a little picture of him in heaven up in the sky in the corner of the picture. And like he he's just always, always part of our family. I had led a very safe life so far. You know, it wasn't until kind of the fertility stuff that I was that I came to a time where I felt like I didn't know where else to go. And God had always been in my life, but it it wasn't until then that I was like, listen, I got, I literally have nothing. I literally don't know what to do. And my sister-in-law, unfortunately, also lost a baby a few years prior. And she had sent me Jesus Calling. And she said, somebody gave this to me when I was pregnant with Natalie or after I had just lost her, I wanted to give you a copy. And I didn't think much of it. Just like, oh, thanks. Thanks for the book. But it was, it was that, it was, honestly, it was that that sort of gave me a a way to look at it differently. I would, I would wake up in the morning I would wait to feel if he was kicking. And then I, if I felt him, I would say, okay, here we go, another day. And I would pull out Jesus Calling and I would see what it had to tell me for that day. And like everybody has said about the book, it's just so incredible how no matter your situation, there are certain days where it just says exactly what you need to hear or gives you the guidance of exactly where you're supposed to go for the day. And the underlying theme that I kept coming across was trust. You know, you're going to go through things in your life. It's inevitable. You know, nobody goes through life in sheer joy and no troubles at all. And I just remember thinking it's, you know, being like, trust in the Lord, trust in what's coming. Trust in the overall plan. Don't think about what you're having to deal with. Just trust that what's happening is, you know, in God's plan. And so 
I started to kind of have a kind of like a mantra where when I would start to to think about the bad, I would just say, I trust in you, Lord, to kind of stop my negative thoughts and to not fall into the dark hole again. I would just stop and say, I trust in you, Lord. I trust in what's going on. I I don't like it, but I trust that you're going to take care of me. You're going to take care of us and you're going to take care of him. He lived for 10 additional weeks after we found out at the ultrasound about his uh, conditions. He passed away and was born on September 4th, 2015. That was the best day of my life and the worst day of my life. It was so amazing to get to see him and meet him. But then at the same time, that's that's when our grief actually started. You know, for for the for 10 weeks we were grieving when he was going to die and then it was finally like, okay, now we're grieving that he did. Um when he was born, it was so beautiful. Everything about it. I mean, Jesus was there. He was in the room. We could feel him. It was like, when I think back about it, it was so amazing. Um, and I'm so thankful that we got to have that because it's the, the only time we ever got to be with him. And it's such a great memory and such a, such a loving time in our life that we were able to meet him and say hello to him and say goodbye to him. When we were talking about names in the beginning and I just thought, I can't, I need to give him a name with, with some meaning. And so we named him Gabriel and the name Gabriel means God is my strength. And when I read that, I thought that's it because God is all that I have right now. I was at the bottom and God was the only place I had to turn. And I thought, since God is going to be the first person he meets, then that is the name he deserves. Gabriel was born on September 4th. And so that day was very much a whirlwind. You know, we were in the hospital and doing all the final arrangements and everything. And um, I couldn't even think that day. And it was the following day, September 5th, that it was kind of like life. It was the first day that life was going to start without him. And also the same day that we had his funeral. And I thought, how, how am I going to bury my child today? How can I do this? And I grabbed my Jesus calling and this was the passage for September 5th, the morning before his funeral. It says, I am your best friend as well as your king. Walk hand in hand with me through your life. Together we will face whatever each day brings. Pleasures, hardships, adventures, disappointments. Nothing is wasted when it is shared with me. I can bring beauty out of the ashes of lost dreams. I can glean joy out of sorrow, peace out of adversity. Only a friend who is also the king of kings could accomplish this divine alchemy. There is no other like me. The friendship I offer you is practical and down to earth, yet it is saturated with heavenly glory. Living in my presence means living in two realms simultaneously, the visible world and the unseen eternal reality. I have equipped you to stay conscious of me while walking along dusty earthbound paths. And there were just so many pieces of that that I was like, are you kidding me? Bring beauty out of the ashes of lost dreams and, and joy out of sorrow. It was like, and like, it starts out, I am your best friend. Like who else? I mean, that's who you need on a day like that. You need your best friend. And there it was. And it was like, wow. That's, that's amazing. We had some time to heal and we took a few years and we just thought maybe, maybe we should think about adoption. Maybe we should think about having another child. And we were both scared. We were both very much like this cannot happen again. We, 
we don't want to go through this again. Why would we even, why would we even consider this? And I just prayed about it and I just said, you know, I don't feel, I feel like something is not closed. There's still something out there. And I just prayed that if there was another child for us, that God would help us get there. And we had another baby in May of 2018. We have another son that has completed our family and just been everything to us. And I just want people to know that if it's on your heart to have more kids or to to find another way for your family to not be scared and just trust that God will take care of you and your family and, and bring to your life what is meant to be. So don't be discouraged and go for it. No parent should have to go through losing a child, but you're not alone. It, it's such a lonely feeling to think like when you lose somebody, everybody else's life moves on and you feel like yours just ended. And I, and I felt so alone. I mean, and if you have a, if you have a tough day, if, if you don't want to talk to anybody, if you just want to be by yourself, just know that and just trust that things will get better and things do get better. It's okay. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to be angry, but also know that no matter what, you're not alone and that you can do it. You can, you can get through it and that God is always, always with you. If you'd like to hear more stories about moving forward after times of grief and loss, check out our interview with pastor and author Jonathan Pitts. Next time on the Jesus Calling Podcast, we speak with pastor and author Dr. Darius Daniels. Dr. Daniels implores us to find our purpose by adding value to others' lives, even if they are different from us, by supporting and showing love as God showed His love to us. At the end of the day, purpose isn't just about the acquisition of things. Purpose is about assisting people in some way. When you carry out your life's purpose, you're going to be adding value to other humans, directly or indirectly. Do you love hearing these stories of faith weekly from people like you whose lives have been changed by a closer walk with God? then be sure to subscribe to the Jesus Calling Stories of Faith podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you like what you're hearing, leave us a review so that we can reach others with these inspirational stories. And you can also see these interviews on video as part of our original web series, with a new interview premiering every other Sunday on Facebook Live. Find previously broadcast interviews on our YouTube channel, on IGTV, or on JesusCalling.com slash video.